everybody, I'm Joe Jackson. Welcome to another edition of the Military Aircraft Video Report. Well, get ready, because this show takes you from sea level to 80,000 feet. Here's a preview. Nothing in the sky can take you faster for a longer period of time. The fabulous Blackbird will put on a show from the ground to 80,000 feet. Find out what it's like to pilot this thoroughbred and see views of this super spy plane that will leave you breathless. You'll find out why becoming an SR-71 pilot is tougher than being an astronaut. Then, it was one of the most important missions of World War II, and yet it is still little known today. Learn about the bold plan to shoot down the most important Japanese military man of that era, Yamamoto. You'll hear from the men who actually planned and flew the mission. Had we been up on the same level with them, we damn now would have almost run right into them. I mean, it was just, it was just that, that way. Find out about their brilliant airmanship. You'll climb aboard a P-38 Lightning for a trip back in time and learn about the controversy that still clouds the event today. When it comes to finding and jamming enemy radars, the EA-6B Prowler is the king of the hill. Go flying in the Prowler on a mission to protect the strike group. You'll see why the Navy places such importance on the mission of this airplane. Also, we journey to Fallon Naval Air Station in Nevada to see a carrier air wing preparing to go to sea. Out in the desert, everything from F-14s to A-6s go flat out with live ordnance. This is how the Navy prepares for the real thing. You'll be there to go on a wild ride in the cockpit with incredible scenery rushing past your canopy. Let's get started with our usual look at some of the latest happenings in the world of military aviation, starting with the F-A-18 Hornet. The McDonnell Douglas F-A-18 Hornet first flew in 1978, and since that time it continues to gain customers around the world. With its Gatling gun cannon, large ordnance capacity, state-of-the-art avionics, and powerful twin GE engines, it is proving to be a multi-role fighter plane of impressive capabilities. This is an example being flown by the U.S. Marines. But now Kuwait is joining Spain, Australia, Switzerland, and of course the U.S. Navy as operators of the Hornet. The Canadian Armed Forces also fly the Hornet. And now that country has accepted the last of 138 fighters originally ordered in a $7 billion program. In a milestone unmatched by all except the United States, Canada's CF-18s have now topped the 100,000 hour mark. The main role for Canadian Hornets is as an interceptor, but the Navy uses F-A-18s on its smaller carriers in both the fighter and attack role. In fact, U.S. Hornets have come close to combat in the Mediterranean, but not as close as these F-14 pilots. Good kill, good kill. Hey, good kill. You're listening to the actual tape voice of the F-14 pilots involved in the latest incident between Libyan fighter planes and Navy Tomcats. Two Libyan MiG-23s were shot down in a wild, twisting dogfight after it appeared the MiGs were going to engage the Tomcats. Here is the actual gun camera film of the incident. Good hit, good hit on one. Roger that. Good kill, good kill. I've got the other one. Short box two, short box two. I got box two. Coming hard, stop. Shoot him. I don't got a tone. Got the second one. I got the second one on the nose right now. Hey, I'm high cover on you. Get a lock, get a lock him up. Lock him up. Navy officials have insisted the MiGs were armed and the gun camera footage does seem to confirm this. Here it is in slow motion.
As you can imagine, some pulse rates were pretty high during this engagement. It's a safe bet the Tomcat pilots in the Mediterranean are taking the term combat air patrol literally these days. Elsewhere, the production run of this great airplane is finally coming to an end. Northrop will cease production of the F-5 T-38 series after putting out 3,806 of them. The final airplane will be going to Singapore and will end quite an era. These F-5s belong to the Navy's famous Top Gun Fighter Weapons School. But you can find F-5s in countries from Norway to Brazil and from Switzerland to Singapore. The airplane that well may end up filling all the niches left by the F-5 is the F-16 Fighting Falcon. The Air Force announced that aggressor units that simulate Soviet tactics are going to convert from the F-5 to the F-16. It is felt that the F-16 does a better job of simulating the new generation MiG-29s. Now Air Force pilots training at exercises like Red Flag will face the 9G turns of an adversary that just might be better than the real potential enemy. And while on the subject of airplanes with a long career, Here's one that occupies a place in political as well as aviation history. There have been a lot of different versions of the U-2 since the early models made those now famous surveillance flights over communist countries in the 1950s. Those flights precipitated a major political incident when a U-2 was shot down over the Soviet Union on May 1st, 1960. Today, most versions of the airplane are called U-2Rs or TR-1s. The airframe is considerably larger to carry more recon equipment. Since upgrade versions of this airplane joined the Air Force as late as 1981, it's safe to say that the original design had a lot going for it. The altitude above 80,000 feet is reserved for very few airplanes. And this is one that will continue to make history in a way that will ensure its unique and almost fabled status. Ever wonder what it would be like to travel at the speed of a bullet? Well, you don't have to be Superman to find out. All you have to do is climb aboard an SR-71. shape like no other on earth. Angular, sinister, sculpted. In some ways it is art. Art that has form as an integral part of function. This is an aircraft so unique and so capable that it is as much myth as it is reality. This is the SR-71. Marysville, California, a peaceful little hamlet in the northern portion of the Sacramento Valley. Life goes on here much as you would expect it to in any slice of small-town America. But one senses that people here do have an awareness that something special is going on, not too far away. If for no other reason, there is an unmistakable sound that emanates from the valley. races at the mere sight of one. 
the ultimate in high altitude reconnaissance, the SR-71 is without peer in the world today. Yet few people really know what this airplane is all about, what it's like to fly, and how much of what we hear is myth, and how much is reality. Join us as we go behind the scenes to clear away some of the mysteries surrounding the SR-71. What was once a U.S. Army base is now the headquarters of one of the most important units in the Strategic Air Command. Welcome to Beale Air Force Base and the 9th Strategic Reconnaissance Wing. We're flying at three times the speed of sound above 80,000 feet is common practice. In many ways, this is more a space plane than an airplane. As you will see, it operates in that thin layer of atmosphere on the very edge of outer space. For the pilots, there is nothing quite like it. Let's learn about this special bird and the special people who fly it. Here's Deputy Wing Commander, Colonel Donald Shriver. In the history of the SR-71, I know of no failures to, to uh, the tasking that's been given from high. And I think that you could talk to anyone all the way up to the uh, various presidents we've had would say that uh, they're extremely pleased with the capability of the SR-71 and what it's done for the nation. It's been, a, it's been an ex excellent airplane. That's because the SR-71 was designed to do some pretty incredible things right from the start. Lockheed's famed Skunk Works, the factory for some of the most sophisticated airplanes ever built, pioneered the rakish-looking design. What emerged was a twin-engine turbojet aircraft with a double delta wing and a long, slim aerodynamic fuselage. The plane is 107 feet long and 55 feet wide. In order to withstand the high heat of high-speed flight, titanium was used extensively for the first time. It first took to the air in 1964, December 22nd to be exact. It was introduced to service in 1966 and was the first airplane that could cruise at Mach 3. As you might imagine, the pilots who flew this bullet were pretty awestruck by it. Lieutenant Colonel Dan House. Well, there are many things I think that make the SR-71 unique uh, one, even though it's been flying for more than 20 years, it's still the highest and fastest flying aircraft in the world. Uh, it was designed uh, to operate at a, in a very hostile environment, Mach 3 and 80,000 feet. Uh, we go up there and we stay up there for quite a, quite a period of time. There are other airplanes that have gone that high or perhaps that fast, but only for, uh, for a few minutes max. We operate there, that's where the airplane wants to be. But notice there are two crew members, a pilot and the backseater called an RSO, or Reconnaissance Systems Operator. When you're traveling at those speeds, it takes the efforts of two people to get in, get the information, and get out safely. Here's RSO, Major Blair Bozek. The uh, colloquialism for the RSO is the spy in the back seat, but in fact we wear a lot of different hats. Uh, we are always there as a co-pilot uh, to the pilot. We don't actually have flight controls, but as far as uh, managing the cockpit and helping the pilot with what he's doing with the jet and where he's taking it, uh, co-pilot duties there in particular, navigator duties of course. We run the defensive systems on the aircraft and also the com uh, communications and the, uh, the sensors, which is why we're going with the aircraft in a certain part of the world in the first place. In order to join Lieutenant Colonel House and Major Bozek among the select crew members of the SR-71, you have to show you can handle this airplane first. This is the training SR-71. 
Notice the extra cockpit fairing. In order to even be allowed to fly in this airplane, you have to be, well, not perfect, but almost. SR-71 crewmen must have a minimum of 2,500 hours, be a volunteer, and undergo the extreme scrutiny of security checks, medical exams, and professional performance reviews. The air crew that we have always had uh, in the program are hand-picked. They are all volunteers, and interestingly enough, they are basically picked by the other members of the squadron. The guys that are doing the job are probably the most uh, competent to decide who should be helping them do the job. And we have a unique organization in that we have a very, very large voice in who comes to go work for us. In addition, the, uh, the folks who designed it, built it, uh, and maintain it, and allow us to do our mission are all very highly motivated, uh, working to the exact same goal, and very well trained. Those standards go all the way back to the beginning in the SR-71 program. Tony Bavacqua was one of the earliest pilots. It uh, took off uh, like a normal airplane if you used to being shot out of a cannon. Tony's retired now, but remembers well the early days. In fact, he tells us that the SR-71 was actually supposed to be called the RS-71. President Lyndon Johnson called it that. <laughs> what, what happened there, I guess, is that uh, when he made the announcement about the airplane being around, he called it an SR-71, where the Air Force had uh, planned on it being the RS-71. But when the president spoke, everything was changed. But no matter the name, the mission was the same. And it often included combat sorties for Tony Bavacqua. They could track us, you know, on radar. But uh, thank God they couldn't narrow it down and, and shoot off their missiles uh, uh, to hit us. The picture of every SR-71 crew member adorns the walls at Beale. It is a select fraternity. Behind me on this board is a uh, chronological order of crews from day one through the present time. The total pictures behind me of the, all the SR crews for the last 20 some years still is fewer in number than the current NASA astronaut corps. Now that we know what a truly rare breed these men are, let's follow along on a mission. It's a far cry from just hopping in and going flying. The SR-71 pilot looks more like he's headed for a trip in a space shuttle than an airplane. Still, when altitudes of over 80,000 feet are involved, there is a whole lot more vacuum out there than atmosphere. After the briefing, crew members are helped into full pressure suits by technicians who will stay with the crew until they are plugged into support systems on the airplane. Prior to this time, each crewman has been given a complete physical, a high protein meal, and extensive information on the weather. And of course, the mission. At this point, the pressure starts to build because there is no margin for error. What we do, where we fly the aircraft, and the speed and altitude uh, combination of flying the aircraft is such that if anything goes wrong, you have either a major handful of airplane or international incident on your hands. Uh, therefore, all of the SR crews are formed crews, and in our case, Dan and I have been in the program uh, better than three and a half years, and I can count on uh, actually two hands how many times I've flown with somebody besides Dan. The tanker is just getting airborne now. And while this may look like the standard KC-135, rest assured, it isn't. The 9th SRW has its own special tankers that support the unit all over the world. You see, not just any old airplane gas goes into the SR-71. The tankers at Beale carry JP-7, a special high temperature blend that is an important part of what helps to keep those big Pratt & Whitney engines happy. Interestingly, while the plane is on the ground, fuel leaks from its tanks. Once underway, the skin expands, shutting off the leak. And that's not all that's exotic about the SR-71.
The airplane uh, is basically a huge fuel tank with some, uh, a few little places for sensors and two big engines. Uh, the real magic, I, I would say, and the most radical part of the, uh, of the whole design is the inlet configuration. Now, without the variable geometry on the inlet, we'd be able to go perhaps half as fast as we do right now. Some very smart people a long time ago, late 50s, early 60s, uh, dedicated teams of engineers using slide rules and uh, a lot of pencils and papers and uh, erasers, I'm sure, figured out the design of those inlets to allow this airplane to go Mach 3. A unique spectacle of flight that few will see and only a handful will ever experience. Once the SR-71 is airborne, the mission begins to unfold. And that can mean going anywhere in the world to have a look with cameras and other surveillance devices. Only 30 of these planes were built, and as a result, it is a rare sight to actually see an SR-71 in flight. One of the few times that can be accomplished is when the airplane slows down long enough to take on fuel. Then you can really appreciate what a beautiful sight the SR-71 is, slipping through the morning sky. While it looks routine, this is a ticklish process. The SR-71 is going just about as slow as it can, and the tanker is moving about as fast as it can. And there are other problems. The speed differential between the SR-71 and the KC-135Qs that we normally refuel off of, as we get towards our maximum gross weight, towards full fuel tanks, we are at, or very near, our minimum allowable uh, airspeed while conversely the KC-135 is pushing his maximum allowable airspeed. They're uh, throttles to the firewall, nose down, shaking, uh, shaking quite a bit, and we're just wallowing around behind them. It's, uh, it can be very tricky sometimes. It's not unusual for the two to remain linked for 20 minutes or more. Remember, this is basically a big gas tank with wings. Raven 1, 200, 230, and uh, Raven 1's a single ship, and uh, vector heading 180. Raven 1, Roger. But soon the SR-71 is free, free to do what it does better than any other airplane in the world. Speed, blistering speed that enables it to survey more than 100,000 miles of airspace in less than an hour.
As you might imagine, this sort of performance broke many a record. The most famous, perhaps, was a flight from New York to London in a staggering one hour and 54 minutes. The Blackbirds have set more than seven speed and altitude records, and one gets the feeling more would fall if some of the airplane's highly classified missions were ever made public. And yet it remains a very flyable airplane. From a pure pilotage uh, standpoint, I'd say the airplane is fairly easy to fly, although you have to temper that with the fact that I've been doing nothing but flying Air Force uh, airplanes for the last 16 or 17 years. Uh, the airplane is fairly docile, uh, low speed and low altitude, all the con although the controls are fairly heavy. And once you get the thing uh, supersonic, uh, climbing uh, up to our operating speeds and altitudes, then it handles very, very well. Back at the base for a few touch and goes. Practice, yes, but one also gets the feeling that the sheer exuberance of piloting such an amazing machine makes it hard to put it back down for the day. But it is clear that the SR-71 will one day be put down for good. It will be retired, but the mission will remain. Well, eventually there's going to have to be a replacement for the SR-71. Uh, there's nothing that the Air Force has said specifically will uh, uh, replace the SR-71, but uh, as you well know, that different aircraft companies are uh, trying to design uh, either a follow-on, whether it be a manned or unmanned uh, vehicle. Uh, there's some talk of, uh, you know, a space shuttle type of vehicle. Uh, but there's going to be always going to be a need for uh, strategic uh, reconnaissance. And uh, as long as we're uh, uh, trying to find out what other people are doing, we've got to have that capability. So why does it all work? The 9th SRW has an extremely complex airplane and tough mission that never ends. They're so proud of it and they realize there's so few of them that if, uh, if they lose one, it's just a national asset gone that's not going to be replaced. And so they have an extreme pride and all the maintenance folks and the crews have an extreme uh, professional pride in that airplane and, and want to keep it flying as long as it possibly can. And one suspects it is also the remarkable capabilities of an airplane that will always be known as the best. This, among all others, flies the highest and the fastest for the longest period of time. Yes, the people of Marysville, California do have something very special happening right next door. The sights and sounds just over the horizon are not only unmistakable, they are the signature of an airplane that will forever in the annals of flight never be forgotten. The SR-71 is now, and probably will remain, the fastest long-range airplane ever built. Its inevitable retirement is a sad thought. Now, let's turn back the clock to one of the most decisive missions of World War II. Watch this. 
The Pacific, early 1943, and the tide of battle was turning. First, there was the decisive Japanese defeat at the Battle of Midway. Then the Americans introduced the P-38 Lightning. It was fast, heavily armed, had a terrific rate of climb, superior range, and a high ceiling. America's highest scoring ace, Major Richard Bong, flew the Lightning. He shot down 40 enemy planes during the war. But at the time, Japan still had one very big ace in its hand. That trump card was in the form of Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto, leader of the Japanese Navy, and the man who planned the attack on Pearl Harbor. The Admiral and the P-38 would meet only once, a fateful encounter planned by this man. Our chances of making this mission about one in a million. Seriously, about one in a million. John Mitchell was then a major in the Air Force commander of the 339th Fighter Squadron based at Henderson Field on Guadalcanal in the Solomon Islands. The Japanese knew they had to strike a solid blow against this American base in order to stop the swing of momentum. What they did not know was that the U.S. had for years been breaking the Japanese code. In April of 1943, a message went out to Japanese forces in the Solomons that Yamamoto himself would visit the forward base of Bougainville precisely at 9.45 on the morning of April 18th. Immediately, U.S. planners reacted. Bougainville was close enough to Henderson Field that there was a chance, a slim chance, that the Admiral could be intercepted and shot down. The loss of the Japanese greatest strategist might just shorten the war. Approval came from the highest levels of command in Washington, and the mission was assigned to the men of the 339th. He was uh, like the number two man, really, in the country uh, next to the emperor. And uh, he was head of their combined fleets, uh, well thought of, well educated, a brilliant man. And uh, yes, it might, we knew that, that it hurt him. And as a matter of fact, the, the Guadalcanal deal, the fact of us, us taking Guadalcanal back from the Japanese, and this Yamamoto mission, in my opinion, uh, turned, turned the war around and started things going our way. The men of the 339th had tremendous confidence in the P-38, although some had as little as four hours in the airplane before going into combat. We had flown P-39s and P-40s up to that until we got to P-38s, and neither of those aircraft were combat capable, really and uh, they couldn't get up to where the Japanese were coming in at 24,000 feet and we could get up to 18 or 20,000 feet, about the best we could do. So then when we got the P-38s in there, we could be sitting up there at 30,000 feet and they came in at 24 and you know, it was, it was just all the difference in the world. A total of 18 P-38s would take part in the mission. There would be a four-plane attack section commanded by Captain Thomas Lanfear and a 16-plane cover section commanded by Mitchell. In order to intercept the planes in Yamamoto's contingent, the Lightnings would have to fly hundreds of miles all over water at low level with pinpoint navigation. It seemed impossible. The only thing I had was a compass which had been uh, given to me, loaned to me by the Navy the night before because my compass wasn't working very well. And the Navy gave me a, a, a new compass, a compass off of a ship, very accurate compass. They, they, they let me have that, which I installed in the airplane, and they swung it, meaning that they uh, set it up so that it would act right in the climate in which it was going to be operating, and which was in my airplane. And I had that in my cockpit, and then I had my watch, and I had my airspeed, of course, and that was it. At exactly 7.25 in the morning of April 18th, the lightnings lifted off from Henderson Field at Guadalcanal. Immediately, two were forced to turn back. One had a malfunctioning drop tank. 
and another blew a tire on takeoff. That cut the attack section in half, leaving only Lamphere seen here on the left, Lieutenant Rex Barber on the right, and Lieutenant Besby Holmes in the center, and another pilot, Lieutenant Ray Hine. It took two hours and nine minutes to fly from Guadalcanal to Bougainville. The flight took place only 30 feet over the water in absolute radio silence. The reason we flew that low and that far away from the islands was because they had coast watches all along the, uh, along the, the uh, Guadalcanal and the, the Solomon Islands and between Guadalcanal and Bougainville. The, the Japanese had coast watches along there. So we didn't want to, of course, alert them to the fact that we were coming. At precisely 9.30, the mountains of Bougainville loomed out of the haze in front of the P-38s. Mitchell had accomplished some amazing navigation. And at that very moment, the radio silence was shattered by the voice of Captain Doug Canning. Bogey, 10 o'clock high. I looked up and saw the two bombers, and then I, uh, I looked behind them, and I saw three zeros and up behind them were three more zeros. And then I knew we had our man. I knew this was, this was the target that we were at. This is where we'd flown 415 miles to get up there and make this interception. Rex Barber of the shooter flight remembers the feeling at that moment. Well, all of us trusted M Mitchell and his uh, navigation and planning. Also, we knew the various uh, variables in the uh, uh, picture and we were apprehensive whether we would find the bombers or not. And when we hit them right on the button, we couldn't believe it hardly. And we were elated. At about five miles, Lamphere made out two Mitsubishi Betty bombers and six of the famous Zero fighter planes. Instantly, the attack lightnings climbed to engage while the cover airplanes went high to provide combat air patrol. Keep in mind the number of bombers sighted. It would later prove to be an endless source of discussion among historians and participants alike. Besby Holmes found he could not drop his tanks, so Lamphere and Barber roared in to attack the bombers, one of which was carrying Yamamoto. The Zeros turned to attack, and Lamphere fired, sending one of the fragile fighters spinning into the jungle. At this point, Lamphere said he then became aware of a Betty moving over the jungle. He closed rapidly and shot out the right engine of the plane, which crashed into the jungle, killing Yamamoto. Rex Barber tells a different story, however, claiming that when Lamphere broke to take on the Zeros, he attacked the Betty that then fell into the jungle. And I was on the left side of a bomber. Now, I didn't know where the other bomber had gone because it was not in my sight at that point in time. I started shooting across into his right engine. I pulled in right behind him and continued to shoot at the right engine. The engine uh, started to smoke badly, black smoke pouring from it, and I went back into the fuselage, into the left engine, back into the fuselage. The right engine was smoking uh, very, very heavily, and uh, I, uh, as I centered on the fuselage, uh, it stopped rather suddenly, and his, his right wing came up. I almost hit his wing as I went over him. Barber says that he then eluded several zeros and flew out to sea, helping to attack the other bomber. Uh, Holmes started shooting, his bullets hit behind in the water, and he pulled his fire up through the right engine, and uh, then on out beyond the bomber. He continued on then, over the bomber, and on straight on south. Uh, Hines' bullets did not hit the airplane, they, he, he, was, he shot outboard of the airplane. And I dropped in behind, the bomber, and uh, as I got fairly close to him, I uh, opened fire, and he uh, exploded. Holmes, by the way, says he thinks it was Barber who shot down the Betty over the jungle. That point is critical, because this was the bomber that was carrying the Admiral. To that shooter would go the honors of having fired the crucial shots. Regardless, at the time, everyone knew what had happened. Uh, there was no question in my mind at, at that point that we had shot down Yamamoto. And uh, for the reason being that the two bombers, instead of one, but that which threw us off a little bit, but we got both of them. We got both bombers. And as a matter of fact, when, the, uh, when we got back to the base and started talking about this a little bit, we thought we had shot down three bombers. It turned out that there were only two. And uh, we got both of them. And, uh, 
I, so I, I knew that we had accomplished uh, what we had gone up there for. At Guadalcanal, it was Lanfear who turned in the first and, at the time, commonly accepted story on what happened. Barber, upon his return, disputed the claims. As it turned out, however, Lanfear's version ended up being the official word for many years. Only now is Rex Barber again speaking out. When we got back to the base, why, uh, there was some discussion about airplanes, and, and it was decided that there were three airplanes. Lanfear claimed an airplane inland, and he also said that I shot an airplane down inland. So uh, then we figured the other one was evidently then a uh, stray bomber that had just unluckily happened in. Well, that was not the case, and as it proved out, uh, there was only two bombers, one inland and one over the water. Thomas Lanfear died in the late 1980s and left behind many still unanswered questions about the mission. Today there is new evidence. The wreckage of the Admiral's plane has been found and the crash site seems to support Barber's story. There is also a Japanese pilot alive today who was there that day. Yanagiya says there were only two bombers. Still, confusion in the heat of battle can and will always happen, and the cold hard facts are often difficult to sort out later. Regardless of any lingering controversy, it is an irrefutable fact that Yamamoto died before he ever hit the ground. The point is that we, uh, we did our mission. Uh, it did shorten the war, I am sure, because there was no uh, one to take his place and later history proved that there was uh, considerable bickering within the uh, hierarchy of their navy and no one ever really got the control of the entire navy the way uh, Yamamoto had it. Historians generally accept that without his brilliant input the Japanese navy was never the same. The direction of the war may have been clear after the Battle of Midway but the outcome was more certain than ever after the mission of April 18, 1943. For it was on that day that a remarkable airplane and a daring set of young warriors pulled off a real life mission impossible. That story is as dramatic today as when it happened almost 50 years ago. Well now, let's give the Navy some equal time. We'll start with one of the unsung heroes of the carrier air wing. of the modern aircraft carrier. It is made up of specialists, men and machines concentrating on individual tasks that together make up the carrier battle group. The E2C will be the high altitude platform for command and control. The A6 intruders will deliver the ordnance. The F-14 will fly combat air patrol and handle long range interception. The A7 will take care of flak suppression and the EA-6B will protect them all, providing an electronic shield during the most critical minutes of the mission. It is called the Prowler, the most effective electronic warfare airplane in the world today. In just a few minutes after launch, the enemy will know that our airplanes are on the way. Picking them up on radar scopes that clearly show their position, altitude, course, and speed. Radar is fundamental to detection and weapons control. An enemy is going to use it to control guided missiles and aerial intercepts. It is instant combat intelligence, and the enemy would be blind without it. The job of the prowler is to take away the enemy's eyes, blind that radar with a blizzard of jamming emissions. You see, there are many radars employed by armed forces all over the world. It makes for a density of electronic emissions that boggle the mind. 
the EA-6B can jam enemy radar without affecting its own forces. The Prowler is the only aircraft dedicated exclusively to fighting naval battles of electronic warfare. The crew of an EA-6B is made up of a pilot and three electronic countermeasures officers known as ECMOs. The airplane is basically a big flying computer, the ALQ-99. Here's how it all works. Emissions of enemy radar are picked up at long range by the sensitive equipment on the Prowler. The ALQ-99 analyzes the signal and shows it on a cockpit display. The ECMOs continuously react to the signals, and when the strike force is within range of the radars, jammers are activated. If an unknown radar appears, the ECMO can assign it a frequency and jam it on the spot. Since the first Prowler was introduced in 1972, it has come of age by meeting the steadily increasing challenge of electronic warfare at sea. Today, its speed, range, and maneuverability are compatible with strike aircraft. In short, it can keep up when the battle gets hairy. Prowler crews are trained at Whidbey Island Naval Air Station in Washington State. Prowler University, as it is called, turns out ECMOs and pilots with a high degree of expertise and motivation. At any time that we have an overheat situation that exists in the constant speed drive, a temperature that exceeds 260 degrees plus or minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit, on the caution lights panel you will have a CSD light that will come on. First, there are the specifics of flying one of the Navy's most sophisticated airplanes. Then specific work begins on the jamming system itself. Airborne now with the pod. Finally, there is an exacting schedule of flight training in a computer-controlled simulator that can provide realistic scenarios for the crew members. Instructors working through nearby consoles can call up programs to simulate any onboard failure or malfunction. The ECMOs are given a workout too, dealing with an array of radar threats. The EA-6B is the only tactical carrier aircraft that has a true electronic warfare capability. Uh, we have a, a set number of them organic to each of our air wings and each, to each carrier. And they're programmed right in with the, the strikes, uh, the defensive uh, tactics, uh, the entire air wing operation. They're very, very important. And we will be dependent on them as we said before in most scenarios. For example, if a prowler has to protect the fleet, it can orbit at high altitude, working with the E-2C gathering information to relay to the force commander. If the enemy is looking for the carrier battle group with long-range radar, that signal can be jammed as soon as it's picked up. The enemy can't see us, but the signal tells the prowler where he is. EA-6B tactics uh, during the mission will be to jam the acquisition, GCI, uh, fire control, and uh, AAA radars. The NAVROW profile, a couple of considerations, will be silent to 60 nautical miles, and we'll turn uh, our jammers on at that point, leave them on for the uh, remainder of the route until the egress. We'll stay with you over the target, come on out and pick you up on, uh, on the right out. The other job of the Prowler is the strike mission. The overall objective is to put this airplane and its capabilities in position with the strike group in order to afford maximum protection for our strike aircraft going in and out so that we have maximum effectiveness, minimum losses. Knowing that the EA-6B is along, even in the practice problems that we run on a day-to-day -day basis for training, uh, gives, us, gives us all a, uh, an increased feeling of confidence. See, the airplane is tremendously capable. Uh, it uh, does the job that it was designed to do, does it extremely well. Uh, I'm very glad they're on our side.
Initially, the enemy is showing only routine radar surveillance. The strike group forms now and begins the ingress to target. Momentarily, both sides are electronically blinded by terrain. But the enemy has been alerted, and when the planes are in the clear again, the prowlers find that the enemy has switched on more radars. The attacker's course, speed, and position are clear. Next, ground control intercept signals appear, showing that the enemy is launching alert fighter planes. At 60 miles, the prowler turns on the jammers and the attack is on. We know we've done our job when we launch out on a strike with 12 or 15 aircraft and we come back and uh, we still have 12 or 15 aircraft. The prowler of today is being continually updated for the needs of tomorrow. The airplane has room for extended performance, and each year money is being found in a tight Navy budget to buy EA-6B Prowlers for tomorrow. In the meantime, the airplane of today is enjoying great success with the Navy and the Marine Corps. The job of the Prowler is to save ships, aircraft, and lives. And for the foreseeable future, no other aircraft in the world can match it. As you heard, the carrier air wing operates as a unit, but it doesn't start out that way. The process begins far from any ocean. In fact, it starts in the desert. Sagebrush. You'll travel for miles in the desert of northern Nevada and see nothing but tumbleweed and sun. Both seem to dominate the horizon. But if your travel should take you out not far from the city of Reno, you'll run across something else on the horizon, a vast ribbon of concrete and a rapidly approaching object that tells you you've reached the most important naval air station in the world. This is Fallon, often referred to as Strike University. before you can run uh, philosophy. This is the first steps of getting everybody back together. A lot of new guys on board and all the different squadrons. And we've been working individually back at our home bases with, uh, with our people in our squadron. But this is, this is the first look for a lot of the new guys and for the old guys to get back together, get back into the books, back into strike planning, and get the air wing all talking the same language. Lieutenant Ken Hitchner is like every other pilot in the Navy. He needs constant training in order to do his job well. He flies the A-7 Corsair, which is a combat-tested veteran airplane. But the A-7 does not do its job alone. It is part of a carrier air wing that is made up of many different kinds of airplanes. F-14 Tomcats, which serve as fighters. EA-6 
V6B Prowlers for electronic warfare, jamming enemy radars. A6 Intruders to deliver heavy loads of ordnance. And S3 Vikings to range far and wide hunting down enemy submarines. Ordinarily, these diverse airplanes are based separately. So in order to work as a cohesive unit, the air wing has to train together. And that is what Fallon is all about. Sit back and watch as we show you how the Navy turns a bunch of airplanes into a well-oiled machine. The commander of the air wing, or CAG, is Captain Tom Ford. Teamwork is the whole key in the Navy. We work with a carrier battle group. We have individual components within that carrier battle group. And the carrier air wing is one of the most important parts of it to make sure that we can execute our mission. In order to help a diverse group of pilots learn to operate as a unit, Fallon Naval Air Station brings together some of the most sophisticated training support ever devised. For example, if you want to find the instructors for the famous Top Gun Navy Fighter Weapons School, yep, look no further. These are the F-5s, flown by VFA-127, the Aggressor Squadron. The Navy's best pilots simulate the tactics of potential enemies to provide realistic adversaries for the carrier air wing. Here's Commander Al Gorthy. The flying is tremendous. Uh, we have an opportunity to fly uh, great airplanes. We fly both the A-4 and the F-5. The A-4 simulates in, in size and turning performance um, similar, those qualities similar, similar to the MiG-21. The F-5, on the other hand, is a very small airplane, but a high-performance airplane, supersonic, and that airplane simulates very closely uh, in speed and performance the MiG-23. And just in case you were wondering if the Top Gun instructors are as good as Hollywood has made them out to be, well, here's a pretty telling statement. To a pilot, um, they know how to perform the airplane, they know what it takes, uh, they know the airplane inside and out, and uh, I would not want to be up against any one of these youngsters in the heat of the battle. But the influence of Top Gun is only part of the story here. Behind the scenes, you'll find sophisticated electronics, such as the tactical air crew training system. This amazing computer gives a real-time image of an unfolding air battle, complete with missile firings. The image can be stored for later discussion after the flight. The tactical air crew system has made training more realistic than ever. Prior to the tax uh, air crews, specifically fighter uh, crews, used to go back after they would go out and train, after they'd do their dog fights, they'd come back and it was basically the first guy to the blackboard who won the fight. And uh, there was a lot of, it was based on, the debrief was based on memory, what you could remember. And uh, uh, being a fighter crew myself when I first started, that was that was pretty hard. A lot of times you didn't remember exactly what went on in a, in a two-minute engagement because it was very dynamic. What has happened with the TAC system is now that we're able to, with uh, the aid of computers and instrumentation, is record the fight, record the, uh, the training as it's taking place, and then come back and provide a replay for a debrief for the air crew so they can actually come back and actually see what they have done. Here's how it works. Special pods on the airplanes send back a signal which is routed to the computer. You know, we say a lot of times about, you know, you're going to end up fighting like you train and you want to train like you fight. Well, here they can come to Fallon, they can strap a pod on their airplane, strap on their jet, and go out and practice exactly what they uh, are going to end up doing in combat. And you can't get a better bang for your buck than you can here at Fallon. Here, an air battle is unfolding on the screen, complete with a missile hitting the target. That's one. Bravo, 
Bravo 17 East rooftop. It can even be done from the point of view of the pilot about to be hit by the missile. This is about the only way one can imagine wanting to be in this position. And now it's time to do what the training is all about, to take to the air for a coordinated strike. And that can be a task in and of itself, says Lieutenant Commander Jim Englander. We have to coordinate the strike aircraft. Perhaps they want to make a certain time on target. We want to put enemy suppression assets in the air at the same time. We want to have electronic warfare jamming going on at a certain time and we want to have our fighters in the proper position to defend the strike group. All of that coordination is what we train to. It's difficult, it takes tremendous training both on the ground and in the air and it takes a tremendous amount of debriefing which Strike U helps us with through the tax range and through the instructors they have there. Once in the air, the pilots settle down to the task at hand. This is the part that everyone enjoys the most. But it is only a small portion of the work that has gone into every facet of mission planning. Flying is wonderful in naval aviation, but there's a tremendous amount of work that goes into every sortie. Uh, we looked at it recently, and, and for a one and a half hour flight now, we're spending something like seven hours of our day to accomplish that mission between briefing and debriefing. Probably most people don't realize that uh, the strike planning itself is uh, 10, sometimes 15 times as, as much work and, and hours than, uh, than just the flying. The glamour part is the Top Gun type stuff where you go up there for an hour and a half and, uh, and fly the mission, but uh, a lot of late nights and a lot of planning goes in uh, to really make it come off right with this many airplanes in the air at one time, all doing the same thing. Still, when one looks out, away from the instruments, and contemplates the rugged scenery flashing by, the sheer joy of flying can't help but be felt.
But these airplanes weren't built simply for the joy of zipping around the sky. Far out in the desert is this, a mock enemy encampment. This may not look sophisticated, but the bombing range is fully instrumented to help in scoring the accuracy of weapons delivery. In another part of the range, marking rounds are fired to designate the target. And uh, Winder copies uh, 6 plus zero, 0 and we'll be marking on uh, target 3. Fire And in they come. First the A-7, showing its ability to put ordnance on the target unerringly. Roger from Lee Pot. The A-7 is a uh, visual bomber, uh, unlike the A-6, which uh, will do a, a more of a nighttime delivery. We pride ourselves on being pinpoint accurate, the best bombers in the air wing uh, during visual deliveries. And we use a computer release system. It's uh, not like the older Vietnam era A-7 when they first came out, or the A-4. Uh, so it takes a little bit away from the pilot in that uh, you get to rely on the computer a little bit and the inertial measurement systems and that type of stuff. Uh, very, very accurate bomber. And uh, we use different computed symbology to, uh, to uh, put the bombs on target. Next, the A-6s show up using a slightly different technique. This airplane is an all-weather computer-guided precision bomber that packs the main punch of the carrier air wing. And the pilots know it. The A-6 is, and I say this without any parochialism, the strike warfare arm of the air wing. It is the power projection aircraft. It's capable of carrying literally every type of ordnance that's in the fleet. And our mission is to project power across the beach when we're at sea, or to project power at land when we're not at sea in the defense of the country. You're clear hot. All of the information from the bombing range, the tactical air crew training system, Goodbye. Top Gun, and many other sources is pulled together and slowly a picture begins to emerge about how ready the air wing really is. We want to make sure that when we are called upon to do business that we're able to execute it professionally, safely, and in the best interest of the United States. And I think when we look at the events that have happened in the world over the last several years, that we have shown that the training that we're doing at Fallon and the unit training that we're executing has really paid off in making sure that we're doing it well. And it is, in fact, a team that returns from the skies over northern Nevada. The pilots landing here are aware of how important it is because out there on the ocean, in another part of the world, there is no margin for error. The best answer I can give to why it's important for an air wing to work together as an integrated unit is because I've been in the Navy long enough to, to have been in the Navy when we really didn't work together as well as we needed to. And when you've seen the before and you've seen the after, the after being when the squadrons are working together, there's absolutely no comparison. The bottom line is the taxpayer is getting more for his money when an air wing is working together like this. Soon, this air wing will be on its way to a carrier deck, and another will take its place. But no matter how many times pilots return to Strike University, they never lose an appreciation for the lessons learned and the sharpened skills. We work hard day in, day out, lots of times seven days a week. We go away from home for long periods of time. Uh, six or seven months or longer away from our families and we do that willingly to defend this country. Most of us have been out of the country, we've seen other parts of the world and when we come back we know how important it is to have the United States and we know that there is no place like home. 
So here, over the sagebrush and beneath the blazing sun, a remarkable thing is taking place. It is hardly known outside of Navy circles, but without it, Navy aviation just wouldn't be the same. Without Fallon, what we do for the nation, what we do for uh, what we're paid to do, would be a lot tougher. Fallon has given us the opportunity with the assets we have to give the American people a far better product than they would have otherwise. As a pilot in the Air Force, I did my share of low-level flying, and I'll tell you, the thrill never ends. Well, that's all for this edition of Military Aircraft Video Report. Remember to check out the other programs in the series. I'm sure you'll enjoy them. I'm Joe Jackson. Thanks for watching. So long, everybody.